Let's go, <laughs> dude. Eric Williams presents, son. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I got Lex Hunt on. This is last minute. I, I texted, well, actually, yeah, I texted you two hours ago. I said, hey, I got a spot opened up. Um, you want to come talk to me about fishing? He said, yeah, let's do one on sheep's head. I said, that's a great idea. I said, let me get done with this T-ball practice and let's go. <laughs> so that's what we're, uh, we're talking about today. We are going to talk about sheep's head, how to target them, what baits you need, tactics, techniques, tools, tricks. We're going to hit all of it. A bunch of T's. A bunch of T's. <laughs> T-balls and T's. <laughs> yeah, um, right. So let's let's start with uh, what kind of bait do you uh, – and, and backtrack for a second. I've never caught a sheep's head. It's on my bucket list. I started trying last year. I fished for them three or four times and never got one. All I do is catch black drum and reds. Not a problem with that, but I want to catch a sheep's head. So if I wanted to catch a sheep's head, what is the best bait that I could use for these fish? Best bait, number one, mud crabs. The absolute best bait that you can get. So if I had, can I rank my bait? Yep, rank them. All right, number one, mud crabs. Number two, I would have to say muscle clusters that you can peel off the side of a dock, and you want about a you want about a quarter size cluster. Um, all, usually the docks with the black pylons. We'll talk about how to find this stuff in a minute. Number three, fiddler crab. So that's my that's my top three. But okay. mud crabs, absolute best bait for big sheep's head. If you want to target big sheep's head, that's the best bait. Where do you find these mud crabs? Oyster beds. So low tide, you need low tide. Pull up on an oyster bed, get you some gloves, so because they will literally slice your fingers. My fingers, you can see there's some slices all in them. Um, it will slice your fingers up. Put some. I get some Carhartt gloves, put those on, start flipping over oysters. Flip them over, grab your crabs. You have to grab them quick or they're going to scurry up underneath the oysters. So grab your crabs quick, have your bucket next to you, throw you some mud, a little bit of salt water in there, throw a couple couple rocks, a couple oysters in there with these crabs. Somewhere they can get out of the sun, they're going to last a lot longer. Put you wet a uh, towel. Put a ta- If you're not going to use these mud crabs that day, which I like to get my mud crabs the day before because I don't like to worry about baits when I'm sheep's head fishing and I'm not trying to only sheep's head fish at low tide. So thinking ahead when you get the, these crabs, get you a towel, wet it in salt water, lay it over in the corner of the bucket. That's going to allow these crabs to maintain their moisture in their little crab gills. So I try to maintain their habitat as best as possible. And the longest I've been able to keep them alive is about two, three days. If you throw some sawdust in there, now y'all don't tell nobody this now, but if you throw some sawdust in there, the crabs will actually last longer. So just a little trick that i've learned and this is just for me um you're storing these uh, mud crabs out out of the sunlight if you're you know it's going to be a couple of days out of the sunlight the the crabs mostly stay out of the sunlight anyways they're kind of hidden up in these oysters so yes keep them out of the sunlight and you wouldn't leave them in your cooler overnight no nah, they'll die okay yeah you want to you want to keep them about what the temperature is outside okay so i mean you got to think about most of the time, these crabs are going to be about this. I mean, they're, they're living outside. You want to keep them outside. Yeah, my experience working with blue crabs, um, once you once you get them cold, they don't do well with reacclimating to a warmer temperature. They slow way down, blue crabs. Do. Yeah. Um, okay, so we know where to where to find them, what to do. Um, also, another tip is if you've got an old set of boots, throw them mm-hmm. in your boat and just leave them in there. That's what I do. My old extra tufts that have holes in them, I'll leave a set in there. So if I get on those oysters and slice them up, I'm not upset about them ruining a good pair of boots. Got to be careful on them oyster beds. Mm-hmm. You fall where you, down. Where you where are you getting mussels from? Uh, pontoons on docks. So the, these docks have mostly black pontoons. So the plastic ones. Yes. So the, some of them have a cover over them, like a like a I don't even know what kind of cover it would be. Kind of like a tarpish thing. I don't know. Black pylons or black pontoons. That's where I find most of the mussel clusters. Mussel clusters have caught me some big fish. These fish, if you cut their bellies open, you're going to see a lot of mud crabs and you're going to see a lot of mussel clusters. That's what these fish are eating. With those mussel clusters, you want to get, like I said, a quarter size. That's what you want. They're kind of stuck together by this algae type of stuff. You're going to end up throwing a lot of these out. Good, good to chum the spot with. If it's falling apart, toss it in by where you're fishing. It's going to help chum the fish up a little bit. Quarter size, 
get your hook in there as best you can because once you set the hook with that thing on there, it's gone. So most of the time, you're going to be setting the hook on sheep's head, though, because that's what, that's what they want. That's what they want to eat. So. And the last one, uh, where where am I finding the um, the little fiddlers? Fiddlers uh, up on a bank at low tide near grass because they want to be able to scurry into the grass if a bird comes, I guess. So low tide on like beachy, sandy areas is normally where I find them. Um, a trick to get those is throwing a hula hoop. You got a hula hoop on a rope, you can toss the hula hoop out around a bunch of them and you just drag the hula hoop and they won't go over the side. Most of them will not go over the side. So if you see a bunch in an the area, they're going to scurry away when you walk up. Toss your hula hoop like a cast net, pull it. I've never in my in life heard of that. Yeah, <laughs> that sounds really good. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, we've got bait nailed down. What type of uh, jig are you using to catch these fish? Man, come on now. You know what I'm using. I'm <laughs> using them 43 two fishing jawbreaker jigs, son. My boy Travis makes them. They're the best looking jigs on the market. I love the way the hook set is. Usually when I set the hook on a fish, it's got the whole jig choked down into its mouth. You want to try to get a good hook set on these fish, which we'll talk about. Those jigs are amazing. Like you put me on Travis. I've been talking to Travis for the last year. It's been about a year. And since I met Travis and started using those jigs, I've caught the biggest. I've got two citations last year, maybe probably another one. But I love those jigs. I love them. I'll link his Instagram down in the description below. But <clears throat> you can also get them at um, Eastern Outfitters yep. in Hampstead. So uh, if, you, if you're up this way, you're traveling up 17, stop by there and grab some. But otherwise, you can order them directly from Travis. Um, one thing I will say about Travis is, is he genuinely cares how his stuff works. So not only is he going to sell you a good product, but he's going to make sure they work. And if they, if for some reason they don't, he's going to make it right. So One of the nicest guys I've ever yeah. had the pleasure of meeting. Uh, he's, he's great. And his all, everything he's ever sent me and everything I've ever bought from him is absolutely phenomenal. Okay. You need hardy stuff for these fish because they're real they're hardy fish. And you're you're it's an aggressive style of fishing. So he makes a good product. When you uh so let's talk spots, you pull up to a piece of structure, what are you looking for? What one thing that's good for scouting sheep's head spots is to ride around at low tide and look at your pilings. So you're going to see spots where that are missing the barnacles on the sides of the pilings. It's good to ride around at low tide. I found a lot of sheep's head spots like this. You'll see a lot of the pilings or a lot of the barnacles knocked off where it looks like a fish. Sheep's head turn on their side and they gnaw on the side of the pilings and that they eat a lot of those barnacles. So you'll see where they've been eating and that's a good spot to go when the water gets above that where those fish have been eating and you'll see Certain docks, I like old docks, but certain docks are, you can tell that they sheep's head have been there eating a lot more than other docks. I love concrete pilings. I love concrete pilings. I love big bridges. Big bridges usually, they, big bridges all have sheep's head on them. They do. and But these big bridges everybody knows about. So these big bridges, they're like public numbers when you're in the ocean. These big bridges are going to get pounded. Excuse me. So it's important when you're fishing spots like that to fish those well-known spots when you don't think they're being pounded, like the beginning of when these sheep's head come in or right before they move out when people are doing other kinds of fishing. Sheep's head are not a real targeted fish around here, I don't think. It's more of a – it's not popular, mm -hmm. you know. So old docks, I like bridges. Um, I like – I like to think about where are people not fishing, right? So if a dock has a bunch of fishing poles and a fishing boat on it, there's probably people who are fishing that dock. If a dock does not look like it's fished a lot, it has a pontoon boat on it or a boat that you're like, ah, these people probably don't fish, might be a good dock to try. So I like to fish uh, areas where, in my head, people zoom past it to go to another spot. That's, that's where I found my biggest sheep's head at is places like that. What uh, is your typical water depth on a dock that you're fishing? Man, I thought I knew that before this year. So I would say six feet or more is what I would normally say, but I caught my I caught my second biggest sheep's head in exactly six feet of water, and I caught the absolute biggest sheep's head I've ever landed in four feet of water, or less. could have been three and a half feet. I mean, it was barely any water. 
this fish was massive and I couldn't see him three feet down. And so I caught a sheep's head this year in 50 feet of water in the ocean. So I think, I think you can't rule much out when it comes to these fish. I think you got to kind of just get out there and try, you know, it's, it's, it's important. I, I wish I could say, Hey man, fish eight feet, eight to 15 feet of water. That's where they're at. I just don't believe it. I just don't believe that anymore. So you're fishing, uh, let's just say it's the, the spot you caught that, uh, the biggest one that you've caught, it was four feet of water. What size uh, jaw record you are using for that? Man, I don't even know because I can just look at it and kind of tell there's not not much current. So I'm gonna use I'm gonna use the lightest one I can use. I mean, like a half ounce. I don't think it. Yeah, I'd use a, probably a half ounce. You could use a three quarter ounce. You could use an ounce. It's it's all about how you fish that jig in the water column, like your technique. Yes, it matters kind of like it matters more in current what size jig you're using because in more in in a heavier current you want to use a bigger jig because you want to keep your your bait right next to that pylon now i drop my bait on the back side of the current is usually where i try to drop it so out of the current out of the current the sheep's head are gonna say you have a pylon right here and your current's coming around either side the sheep's head's gonna chill like on the back side of that current or right in that current you gotta think about these fish are not ambushing stuff so they're a redfish will chill on the right on the edge of trout on the edge of the current sheep's head they're trying to be as lazy as possible and eat and they're eating right off a piling so they're going to sit out of that current that's that's where i've always caught them out of the current that's and that's the theory that i've kind of made in my head that they're just lazy especially the big ones they don't want to be trying to swim up to the piling and current are you uh, scraping barnacles off of these uh, docks that you find? or I stopped doing that halfway through the year. So I was doing that. I would get a um, spackle knife or like a drywall knife, and that was the easiest way. I, I started putting a glove on because I'd always bust my knuckles up trying to scrape the pylons off because I think I'm a Billy Badass, you know. So I, I put a glove on, and I'd start scraping the pylons, and that keeps my knuckles from getting banged up. But – uh. I quit doing it halfway through the season, caught two citations. So I could have been – I think there's a point that you get to when you chum up a sheep's head or you chum up sheep's head where you might give them too much and they're not really – yeah, it can fire them up, but it's a double-edged sword. Like I think you can get you can get a bite going. You can catch a few little ones. I Personally, I'm going to drop my bait down before I scrape anything first because if there's a big one there, he's going to want that crab. How long are you spending on one specific set of pilings? If I chum, I'll chum it and I'll move to another one. I'll chum it and I'll move to another one and I'll fish it and come back because it'll take a few minutes for those fish to get fired up on that chum. If I'm not chumming, I'll drop a crab down in 30 seconds. I'm moving, dude. If I don't get bit, I'm moving to the next piling because my experience is that every every time I've caught any decent sheep's head it's been within i've gotten the bite within the first 30 to 45 seconds usually within the first 10 seconds of it being close to the bottom so i don't waste too much time in one spot now i might fish a piling here and then move two pilings down or even to the next piling because there could be a fish on the next piling down there's been plenty of times where i'm fishing a piling and there's no i get no bites i move one piling down i catch the fish or I move two pounds down, I catch the fish. If I'm getting bit and them crap, them them mud crabs are coming off my hook, I'm driving down the same exact spot because every single big one I've caught has picked me off first, which is interesting to me. Because you think bigger fish, you think like bucks, like big bucks, they're smart. They ain't gonna come back to a spot, you know. So my experience is if you get picked off, drop it right back down, try to get them again, be ready for that hook set because that's that's huge. How far down the piling are you dropping your mud crabs? All the way to the bottom, and I give it half a reel up. So I want my line as tight as possible because these fish, when they bite, it feels like a pinfish. So it's really not aggressive at all, for the most part, most of the time. Now, I drop it. Can I talk about the technique of how I catch them? Because you're kind of asking me that. Where I'm going. All right, so I'm putting my mud. Let's just walk through how I'm going to fish a piling because so we don't miss anything. And I'm going to try to concentrate. I'm going to try to use the force. I'm going to try to use the sheep's head shepherd force to concentrate for you guys on uh, Eric Williams presents right now. And I'm going to give you, I'm going to envision this in my head. So 
I'm pulling up to the spot. I'm going to tie my boat directly off to a piling because I got a Caroline skiff, and that thing is mean and it's green, all right? I'm going to tie it off to the piling. Like I said, I'm not going to chum. I'm going to grab my nicest, one of my nicest baits. I'm going to clip it on to my 43-2 fishing jawbreaker jig because that's all I use, guys, because they're the best that there is. I'm going to put that hook through the back legs of the crab. I'm closing my eyes right now so I can envision this for you guys. So I'm not that really that dumb, but kind of I am. I'm going to take my, I'm going to take my jawbreaker jig and I'm going to go into the back leg. Not necessarily, I'm going to open my eyes now, guys. Not necessarily expose the hook. Put my hook in. You don't necessarily have to expose the hook. Most of the time I will put a hook in and I'll come out through his, the mud crab's other back legs. When I get my crab hooked how I want it, I'll drop my crab down. Let's say I get a bite in the first 15 seconds, and I'm not ready for the hook set. Because once you get the bite, that's it. You ain't, most of the time, you can leave it there for another 5 or 10 seconds. Sometimes I'll come back for the leftovers, but most of the time, that's it. Drop, I'm dropping my crab down to the bottom, however deep it is. If it's not staying close to the pile, time to get a bigger jig on there. Let's say it's staying close to the pile and I'm dropping it down slow, but I'm keeping keeping my line tight the whole time I'm dropping it down. As soon as it hits the bottom, I'm closing my bail. As soon as it hits the bottom, I need to know how long it's going to take to hit the bottom, and I need to be – you cannot – you can't relax sheep's head fishing. It is not a relaxing thing to do. You have to be on your toes at all times if you want to catch these fish. Drop it down to the bottom, line's tight the whole time. Flip the bail, half a reel up. I flip the bail, half a reel up. I'm going to start to move my rod up about six to eight inches, about like that fast. You can do it real slow. You can do it real slow just like that. If I'm not getting the bite, I might reel my crab up. I might snip a little piece of him off to get a little scent in the water. If I am getting the bite, I'm going to take that. If I get picked off by this fish a couple of times, I'm going to leave that hook inside the crab. I'm not going to expose that hook. I'm going to start hooking the crab different. Because I'm going to get that fish if he's there. I'm going to change some things up. If he's picking me off, I'm obviously, I need to change some things up. I'm moving that bait up and down, up and down. Hold your hand out, Eric. So this sheep's head, the biggest ones I've ever caught, felt like that. I mean, I'm barely tapping Eric's finger here, guys. Like, that is what a big sheep's head bite feels like. As soon as I feel that tiny little thump, it is time to build, dance, set that hook into that sheep's head mouth, okay? I mean, I need everything you got. So your rod tip needs to stay. It needs to stay six inches from the water so you can really set the hook into this fish. You have to get that hook set. That is imperative to catch these fish. You set the hook, your drag needs to be locked down. You need to be holding a rod. You need to, for the most part now, they've caught me slipping before, and I've still landed them. But you need a rod with some backbone in it because you're fishing structure. You need your drag locked down. When you go to set the hook into the sheep's head, that fish is going to be mad. He's going to be mad, and he's going to be trying to pull you into the structure. He's going to be trying to pull you down. So dry, drag lock down. Try to get that first. It's like a grouper. Get the first few feet on him. He's, he's going to run a couple of times. That Sheep's head are some of the most underrated fighting fish that we have. They fight so good, dude. Lock your drag down, get your boy with a net, land that sucker. And that's, that's, uh, that's, I feel like I did a good job. Did I do a good job? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Cause I love sheep's head fishing, dude. I'm obsessed. I don't even know what to ask. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm obsessed. So the technique of moving. Yeah. It, so let's ask, I want to ask okay. about that. So I've tried to catch them last year. I fished them three or four times. All I would catch is black drum. But I was not doing the up and down. Is that you have to do that? You don't, you don't have to do that. But if you don't have your bait up off the bottom, you're not going to feel that bite. Mm -hmm. Big mistake people make is leaving your bait sitting on the bottom. First of all, I don't think a sheep's head is going to eat. For the mo most part, I don't think they're going to eat off the bottom. I mean, I'm sure I've caught some off the bottom and didn't know it, but it's, if you go to lift that rod up and you feel some resistance, time to set the hook. You might not have felt the bite. Your your bait could have been on the drop when the fish bit it. That's why I move, I'm constantly moving my rod up and down like this, about like this cadence right here, because I want I don't want to drop it too quick because I don't want my line getting a bow in it. Moving it up and down about six to eight inches. That rod tip needs to stay close to the surface of the water because if you don't, you're not going to get that hook set. Hook set is the most important thing about sheep's head fishing. 
you mentioned earlier you like a stout rod. What kind of line are you using? I like to use 20-pound braid and 30-pound fluoro when I'm fishing for these fish. I've never – I don't think I've had much of a problem getting the bite with 30-pound fluoro. Um, could be because those jawbreaker jigs are amazing. Uh, could be because my bait is good. I don't know. But 30-pound uh, fluoro because you're going to get a lot of rubbing up against pilings. These fish have teeth. I mean – I can't tell you how many of them I've been able to pull out of the pilings because my gear is just a little bit heavier. If you go 30-pound braid, it's fine too, but you got to think about the current pushing. The The thicker your braid, the more your braid's going to get kind of pushed in the current. For for me, that's my experience. I think 15- to 20-pound braid is absolutely sufficient for these fish. That braid is super strong. You ever tried to tear it, wrap it around your hands? Yeah, and it's impossible. Like a Chinese finger trap, dude. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so it's like... 15 pound braid, 30 pound fluoro. You could use 20, 25 pound fluoro. You'll be fine. What time of year did you start catching them last year, roughly? Right after the Benito left, I started targeting the sheep's head, which was a good time because nobody was targeting them yet and they had just come in shore. So, May, like okay. like middle end of May, I started to catch them and, and nice black drum too. So water temp seventy degrees at that point. I can't remember. Probably inshore. I would think I would think seventy probably in May. Okay. I, I can't remember. I didn't yeah. pay attention to it. Is there anything else I failed to ask you about sheep's head? It was something I was thinking about earlier. We've talked about the bait, the line, the I guess the reel. You're using a three thousand. 2500 yeah 2500 I, I like to use 2500 because okay. i mean you're you're fishing 20 feet at the most mm -hmm. so let can i tell a story about the one i jumped off the boat and get? oh yeah for sure tell me uh that was your biggest one right that was my biggest one all right let's hear so, it so eric will link this video i know eric <laughs> he'll link this video in I the will. description so i pull up to a dock it's in a spot where I've never seen anybody fishing. It's a stretch of docks that people just don't, for some reason, they don't mess with anything there. They don't fish. Um, it's four feet of water. at Where I'm at, it's four feet of water, high tide. So it's literally no water at low tide. So I'm thinking that maybe these fish only have access to these pilings at, at high tide. So they're like trying to get in there and chomp away at it. That's my theory. I pull up. I got my buddy on the boat. I forget. I think it's like eight pound sheep's head, Riceville Beach, or something like that. So we pull up. I drop my. It's the last piling of the day that we're fishing. I got my top water trout rod, which is a small pin uh, conflict. It's like a fifteen hundred or two thousand, and it's like on the lightest rod I could get to work a top water all day and not get wore out. I dropped a forty three two fishing jawbreaker jig down with a mud crab on it. I get picked off immediately. So I'm like, all right, we might I might get one here. It's my last cast. It's my last spot. I drop another one down. I feel the bite because I'm ready. After that first time you get picked off, you're ready in that second time. I feel the bite. I set the hook and it feels like I set the hook into a damn oyster bed. I'm like, bro, gotta fish. So I set the hook. I walk up. I'm in the middle of the boat. I walk up to the front of the boat. And my trolling motor is pushing me back away. I'm set. I'm right here. Piling's right here. Boat's moving this way. I walk up. My trolling motor's pushing me away. I yank the plug out because I can't find the remote. And, like, it's utter sheer chaos at this point. I'm, like, three feet from the dock. I'm, like, time to go. I jump off the front of the boat, land onto the dock, and I got this little rod, and this thing's bent up. And I'm looking back at my buddy, Mike. Shouts out to Mike. I look back at Mike. I'm like, don't let the motor hit. Don't let the motor hit because the boat's going backwards and the motor's about to hit a pile. And he saved my motor. Thank you, Mike. I'm on the fi on the dock fighting the fish. And I'm like, this is a big one. Like I knew it was, it was a citation. I knew it was either close or it was. I'm fighting this fish. I realize I ain't got a net. And I got the, this fish going to snap my rod in half. I try to dock flip it. There ain't no dock flipping this fish. I see it. I'm like, hey, man, throw me the net. Mike javelins the net like a superhero, lands it onto the dock like a daggone Olympian, bro. Like, this dude threw that net probably 20 yards. I'm like, there goes my net. Bam, it lands right beside my foot. I'm like, dude, grab the net, net the fish, freak out. I'm like, biggest one I've ever caught. But, I, I mean, I will jump on your dock to land a sheep's head, so... I just just know that if you see me there, I'm gonna get this. I'm gonna get the biggest sheep's head you've ever seen off your dock, and I'm gonna jump off your dock. I can't tell you how many times I've been fishing people's docks, 
and they see me catch a monster sheep's head, and they're like, how'd you do that? And I'm like, come here. I, let me give you one of these 42 through fishing jigs. I'm going to tell you how to do it, big daddy. But, yeah, that's a, I thought that would be a cool story to share. You uh, mentioned earlier that you tie up to docks, and then right then you were running your trolling motor? I don't tie up to people's docks. I'm sorry. So people don't like it when you tie. I tie up to, like, bigger bridges, pilings, like okay. that, those type. I'll use my trolling motor to keep me – Literally, I have a rod in one hand, and I'll have my remote in my other hand. And I'm using my, my remote to keep my trolling motor within a couple feet from that pile. And it's, it's kind of risky, but it's literally just me on the front. So, like, I'll be standing there moving it up and down. And whenever I do uh, set the hook on a sheep's head, I'll, use my, I'll have him locked up and kind of use my trolling motor to push me back away from that. It's actually a good tool, but it is kind of sketchy. People don't like when you tie off their docks. I've mm-hmm. had plenty of people think that I'm tied off and come out saying, what are you doing? What are you doing? And I'm like, hey, I'm I'm on a trolling motor, bud. Like, you don't own the water. I'm the boss of this boat. <laughs> 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 but, yeah, people don't like when you tie off to their docks. You can tie off the bridges. I think that's legal. I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, we just won't, we just won't talk about that. Yeah, I don't know <laughs> if that's legal or not, so who knows. But yeah, that's I didn't even think about that. Yeah, I don't tie off to people's docks. Yeah. That's their property, but okay. the water is not their property. So yeah, that was the last thing I had. Anything else you would like to add? Man, I think we covered it all, dude. Okay. Like I've had some crazy, uh, crazy time sheep's head fishing. If y'all want to go sheep's head fishing, my captain's license should be here very soon. By the time this drops, I hope. I hope my captain's license. I'll comment on this and let y'all know if the captain's license is here. Hunt Riggs Charter Co. Follow us on Instagram. Y'all go check out my YouTube channel, Lex Hunt Fish. Sorry I didn't wear my suit my cowboy hat tonight. I came straight from T-Ball. I do got some short shorts on that y'all can't see. But y'all go follow my YouTube. Follow me on Instagram, Hunt underscore NC 1917. I'm going to change that up to Captain Lex probably when I get that piece of paper because that's how your boy rocks. If y'all need a house, holler at my boy, all right? I will uh, link everything you just said <laughs> down below because you just gave them a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, and thank if, you so much yeah, for man, having me yeah, on. Anytime, <clears throat> I love talking to Eric, guys. Eric is an amazing human. And what you see, the way Eric acts on his videos and the way that he acts on his podcast, exactly how he is in real life. That's why I like you, bro. Appreciate it, man. Yeah. I, I love having you on. I, I thank you for your insight and your knowledge, and uh, we'll do it again.